Hi, Miley Cyrus. Hi, Mark. I'm so happy to see you. I'm so happy to see you and your mullet. It's Y'all, amazing. No. I've put on a white button down twice in my entire life. Once for mm-hmm. this and once for when I interviewed Senator Elizabeth Warren. And in the past four months, I think I've washed my hair twice. Once for you and once for Sir Elton John. So these are this, this is the new way to do things. We were talking about how technology and connection, being able to really like utilize this and stay connected and for all of us, our world to continue to revolve and, and keep going. But it's also really nice to only get ready from the waist up these days. Yeah, I only steam this part of my outfit. <laughs> Everything else is just like still kind of damp from the wash. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you, I mean, you took to this pretty quickly. I mean, you just started a talk show right away. How did that happen? Like what, what had you been wanting to do a talk show? And this was just sort of, Hey, this is a perfect time to do it. Well, I didn't have near as many people to talk to as I usually (laughs) do. You know, part of my life is connecting with so many different people daily. Um, I think that's why, you know, I grew up kind of I actually did a lot of kind of self exploration and realization. I think as a lot of us kind of had time to do, um, again, we're going to talk about kind of the parallels of black mirror and that universal waking up, but there, there was a feeling and is a feeling of waking up. And so I kind of realized, you know, from whether it was being a literal infant, I grew up on a tour bus with my dad. I was surrounded by thousands of people. Um, then going into school, having that kind of like, normal elementary, middle school, then in middle school growing up, moving to California and being on a set and just filled with people, a live audience once a week, touring. So again, just so many energies. And this was the first time that everything really stopped and it was just me. Um, And, you know, I think I, I did feel at first that it was good for me to have that time to kind of realize why I love connecting with people and why I've chosen the path that I have. And a lot of it has to do with connecting with people, whether it's through writing or whether film or television or whatever it is, you know, something about being on people's TVs at night and connecting with them. I, I haven't really had that in the past 10 years. So, so having that again, I think directly communicating with my fans. Um, and this time rather than, you know, once a week, this was five times a week. And it gave me, you know, it gave me that, that purpose that I think, a lot of us were going, oh, what do we do with this time? What is our purpose? Um, and, you know, a lot of my value that I find in myself is the ability to just connect with people and talk about, again, some of the issues that are being magnified at this time, not like by no means are any of these issues new. It's just the magnifying glass and the attention. And so to be able to do that every day and connect with my fans and talk about some fun stuff, but then talk about the hard things too. And, and it was just it meant a lot to me to have that connection again. So does this mean when we go back to so-called normal, we're going to see a Miley TV show, talk show? We'll see. You know, I, I really have enjoyed one thing that I loved about it that I think would always be important and I would never want to lose is there was really no pressure. Um, You know, usually when you're, when you're doing a TV show, there's, again, it's always like, the numbers and the viewers and the time. And, and that's what really like, I mean, again, it's so parallel to what we'll, we'll talk about with Black Mirror. That's not what drives me. Um, I never even like know how to find the number. Someone will tell me some number. I'm like, where the hell do you even see that? I, it's about, like, again, it's about that connection. And so I loved how there was really no pressure. And it was like, if the show went over, great. If the show had some tech problems, there was really, it was just about doing it for the love of it. Right, but will you have a TV show? <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> um, when you're alone, do you do you relish those times now because of your life has been so full of just people pulling you in all different directions? Do you ever just sit, whether it's in your studio, your living room, and just go, I'm by myself now, I need to breathe? Yeah, you know, I've been trying to spend, you know, that that time and take advantage of that time. But also, um, I guess within the last couple of weeks and and last month, it felt like, again, I kind of had a a duty to use my platform to amplify 
uh, the voices of the Black Lives Matter movement and being able to actually join safely some of the protests here in LA. And I think it's just been really, you know, it's been a time that has been for all of us to stop, but it's also been a time where we have to go and the attention and the awareness is here. Um, and the time is now and to be active. So I think I've tried to have that balance, you know, right now I've been reading a book called The Intelligent Leader and it's talking a lot about like your values. And I think something that can get lost in the go, go, go is our values, which are why do we do what we do? Not on a level of just do what we do, whether it's for our career, but why do we tick the way we are? What, what, like, why are we programmed this way? And so I've been kind of going to the beginning, you know, going to me being a small child and all the way up until now and going, okay, this is what made me who I am. This is the mosaic that makes this full picture of what I've become. But again, yes, it's a time right now, I guess that we've been able to have these last few months for self-reflection, but now it's about, it's about going, I think. And, and there's a lot of uh, responsibility that we all have to see justice for everyone and to use our platforms in the way that can really create the change we want to see, especially with such an important and, election coming up. And we're seeing, you know, the music industry, you know, every day we're hearing a different change. You know, Lady Antebellum just today, getting rid of Antebellum and they're just going to be Lady A. Um, the Grammys are getting rid of the category of urban music. Do you think the change is going to be lasting? Um, you know, a lot of people are hesitant saying, you know, it's just the issue of the day and tomorrow it's going to be something else. I, I know that I'm committed. I can only really speak for myself and what I know that it's, it's a crucial time for me to educate myself and to never, you know, right now to, I'm not a teacher, not the preacher. I'm the student. And I think that only person I can really speak for is myself. And how not only are the you know next six months coming up to one of the most crucial elections, you know, probably maybe of my lifetime coming up in November. And then that's what I worry. What's beyond that? How do I stay active? How do we when things are, you know, when I'm working with Global Citizen now, working on uh, treatments and working towards getting a vaccine. And once that happens, once we're all back to our lives, how do we stay as active as we've been? Isn't that funny? We've been more active from home than maybe we ever would have been before. I, listen, I tell this to people all the time. I've, as much as I worked before, it feels like it's been nonstop right now. And I think a lot of it has to do with, one, we want to stay busy. We're, we're social animals. We want to be doing this stuff. And also there's no separation now. Right. You're at home, you're at work, it's all the same. And also I think that's what's been so incredible about seeing so many people rallying together at these protests is it's putting ourselves aside um, you know, and having this, like, we haven't all been unified one. I mean, I, I guess in really in history, but now when we're talking about just, I mean, looking at the last four months now, what is bringing people out of their homes and together into the streets and saying, we're going to take all the safety precautions, but we have to be there. Um, I just think it's been really amazing and it's been really great for me to see, you know, obviously in LA, it's just been incredible. And I've been able to, to get involved myself and then also just sit back and listen. And I think that's what the last few years, or I guess even the last like 15 years in the industry has been to me was as an entertainer, a lot of the time you're expected to be loud, whether it's in our actions, our views, our opinions, we're meant to be loud and entertaining. And for right now, just to be quiet, I think is what is really being asked. I think to be quiet and to listen and to learn. Do you ever look back at some of your loudest moments and either go, I cannot believe I did this? Um, what was I thinking? Um, I One of my favorite interviews is when I say anyone that smokes weed is a dummy. That one's really good. That one I love <laughs> to send to my parents who are big stoners every now and then. Um, anyone that smokes weed is dumb. Um, but... You know, again, like it's been really important for me over the last, you know, over the last year, um, living a sober lifestyle. And just because I really wanted to, I really wanted to just like, just really polish up my craft. You know, I had a really big vocal surgery actually in November. Um, it was all just kind of a weird turn of events, how I even figured out 
that I needed this surgery. Um, so I had freaking four weeks where I wasn't allowed to talk. Me. So I got a, I was so ripped from writing on the whiteboard, yelling at everybody. Um, I had this one big bicep from just yelling at my mom and going like this and still trying to do meetings. But it kind of prepared me for the stillness and the quietness. Um, and then when I was preparing, so I was going to do my first show since that surgery, I was heading to do a bushfire relief concert in Australia, which had been kind of a second home to me. So I was, I was literally about to board the plane the day after, and we got shut down. This is right when coronavirus kind of started taking over. And so it's just been an interesting last like six months um, for me because I kind of got forced into that reflective period before from, from this surgery. What was the surgery for? What happened? I just had, it's actually from, uh, it was really funny. My doctor looked at my vocal cords and he said, no one shy ever has to get this surgery. This is from overuse of the vocal cords. So it's no surprise that I would have this. Um, it's basically, I guess, probably from, you know, I've been touring since I was 12 years old. And again, it's not even the touring that's the harder part. It's you know, you end up staying up late and meet and greets and things like that. And obviously I just talk a shit ton. Um, you did mention living a sober life. Are you sober, sober? I've been sober, sober for the past six months. And the beginning, it was just about like, you know, obviously with this vocal, again, this vocal surgery was kind of the biggest blessing uh, for me. Right. And just like finding that clarity. And again, just going through a lot of, um, like therapy that I think is great for everyone. It has, you know, nothing to do with, you know, everyone's, I guess, experiences in life. They're just so deep and detailed. And been thinking a lot about like, you know, my mother, my mom was adopted. And so a lot of the feelings that she had and inheriting some of that kind of abandonment feeling and, um, you know, a feeling of wanting to prove that you're wanted uh, and valuable. And, you know, my, my dad grew up, um, in a, a home his parents divorced when he was three and so my dad kind of like raised himself and so really taking this time even though i couldn't be with my parents physically because actually both of them which they're so lucky i wish i lived with my parents both of them live with their parents on the property my mom's in la with her mom and my dad's in tennessee with his mom so i wasn't able to see them to keep them safe um but i did a lot of family history um, which again, like has a lot of kind of addiction and, you know, kind of mental health challenges. And so just going through that and saying, what, why am I the way that I am? And so now I have a better, by understanding the past, we understand the present and the future much more clearly. So I think therapy is great. It is great. And I'm, I'm going to be, I'm celebrating uh, my sober birthday. July 7th will be seven years. Congratulations. A drink or a and it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. And then, you know what, I, a lot of people ask me too, you know, I, it's really hard because especially being young, you know, there's that stigma of like, you're no fun. And it's like, honey, I know you can call me a lot of things, but I know that I'm fun. So I know that I'm fun. And the thing that I love about it is waking up 100%, 100% of the time, because there are a lot of challenges again, that you wake up and when they're when when we're being asked to be this active and this on and this focused and we're going to be making these big changes we want to see i don't want to wake up feeling groggy i want to wake up feeling ready and so again with bright minded i do best when i have structure when i i have my gifts can really become my weaknesses if they're not being used to better and to rather than, you know, my, my, my greatest talents can get me in the biggest trouble when I am not using them towards, you know, something like bright minded, you know, that, that having that schedule. And I think a lot of that, again, I realized had to do with kind of growing up, you know, my parents had me in public schools and then I went to a set and then I always had structure and I thrive on structure. And when I haven't had it in the past, that's when I get into dangerous situations. Let's talk Black Mirror, um, Ashley. Um, we can't help but look at Ashley and think, is that really Miley? How much of that is Miley? What did you, well, I'm going to think. I thought you may want to ask Ashley herself. My friends, we just had a little uh, small pride gathering at my house and so many of my friends um, aren't being able to go to a pride parade this year. So they all fought over who got to do Ashley's makeup. So one eye is done by one friend and one is done by the other because everyone wanted to make up Ashley. Um, 
but I brought her over so she could answer some of the questions herself. But, you know, um, again, there obviously there's obvious similarities, um, but there's really, really important differences that really help develop the character. So I'm excited to kind of go through those and talk about those with you. Yeah, so, so tell me, how, first of all, how did it come to you? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? Was the story first or did the story come after they approached you? The story was written first and uh, the script came to me and obviously I read it and I kind of had to like laugh out loud at some of these similarities because some of them were very obvious. I thought it was very funny that Charlie thought it was sneaky to make the, uh, the big mouse car. Um, I thought that was pretty obvious. Um, you know, and again, uh, some of the similarities where it's like, oh, with the wig on, you're a big famous pop star and without it, you're just a normal girl. Uh, like, honey, I've played that role before. Um, so there was obviously some obvious similarities through the character that I've played before that actually kind of really became my life. Um, and then there are the, some of the obvious differences to me, um, again, kind of came from a similarity of her wanting to explore like kind of rock and roll and change genres. And that's something that right after Hannah Montana was really important to me. Like I remember um, fighting to do the Billy Idol tribute or when they said, who do you, uh, Oprah wanted me to perform with my idol. And so I brought Joan Jett. You know, I think everyone thought I'd bring Christina Aguilera, or Britney Spears, but I wanted to do Joan Jett. Um, and I kind of had to fight to make that happen. So some of the kind of like, you know, genre bending. And again, it's definitely a real thing where it's like, you know, to kind of gain creative control of your life, you do sometimes lose some of those fans that came with you from the beginning that love the Ashley O, that love the Hannah Montana. So the similarities and the differences, the, the main difference to me um, of my character is I don't have an Aunt Catherine. You know, my family... And my, my mom has been my momager. I'm almost freaking 30. My mom is still my mom. My mom, I don't, I don't buy a light bulb for my house without asking my mom if it's the right one or if it's okay. So I've had a mom that without them, without my parents, I'm not sure. I bet my life would have been more similar to the Ashley O story. The thing that I had that really makes me different than Ashley O are my parents and the team that my parents put around me. Like when I was looking for a manager, we got whoever Dolly told me would be protective over me. It didn't have to do with, oh, he's going to make you a star and he's going to whatever. It was, you're going to feel comfortable Protection. with your child traveling with him and he's going to take care of her and like respect the values. And so again, it was a big difference is that family and having my dad and Dolly kind of guide me. Mm. So um, tell me about performing as Ashley, putting that wig on, putting the, you know, the sim. Yeah. Why? I lived, you know, we shot in South Africa. And so I, I know, which was really, really funny because it took place in Malibu, which I was living in Malibu <laughs> at the time. So I'm like, no, well, could have made this easy. But um, I really enjoyed my time in South Africa. And it was really cool to, I've, I've kind of made records and traveled all around the world, but um, I got to spend about a month there and record in the studios and um, I got to work with some choreographers I maybe wouldn't have worked with before. Um, and it was just a really cool experience being so kind of isolated from like my direct kind of family and friends. I was able to really disconnect from myself and I was really able to get into Ashley. Um, and I don't think I would have been able to do that if I was in the comfort of like having everyone around me that I'm, I, I, I there was a, there was a cold and loneliness um, to being so far from everyone that I'm usually with. Also, during some of the the scenes where the main, when Ashley wakes up from the coma um, and it's totally traumatic, that was the day that I had lost my house in Malibu to the fire. So I was able to pull from that trauma uh, and use that in the scene, even though that was really hard. There was times where I had to like stop and just go outside and totally melt down and, um, it was, it was just a really interesting time for me because so much was kind of falling apart in my personal life. And it was the same thing that was happening in Ashley's life. So it was just, it gave me a lot to use. But then, you know, over the past year, it's been nice, I guess, to have this time of, of reflection too, because I didn't really get to deal with it personally because I really just put it into Ashley and, and used it. Um, but I loved, I loved filming the videos. Again, that was like some escapism. That's the great thing about pop culture that I love. Again, as much as I love, 
you know, playing with other genres or I love dabbling in country or rock and roll. The thing that I love about pop is pop culture and the escapism that it can bring. You know, there's times when we just want to be in it, but when we watch a video like uh, I'm on a roll, it's like reality is just pushed on pause for a second and you're just in it. The hard thing with that and, you know, what isn't understood by Ashley O's fans or mine is what you're seeing in those videos always isn't the reality uh, for that artist. And, you know, she kind of thought that Ashley O had a perfect life. She lived in a big house in Malibu and she was the biggest star in the world, but at home she had a lot of, you know, kind of abuse and torture from Aunt Catherine. It's so interesting that what you said about the fact that you were filming that um, when you lost your house, because one of the things I was going to comment, and I'm going to, is the fact when you woke up from that coma, it was real. Like that guttural reaction from you. I was like, oh, well, I don't think I've ever seen something like that from you in any, uh, any other project. So that makes so, mu so much sense. It was, it was real. And actually, my, uh, one of my best friends who's, I don't even know how to really describe, just kind of my everything. He tells me when I'm to wear and, you know, um, my, my, he was there and he actually was really worried about me because I had on real heart monitors. So all those screens behind you, I had real heart monitors on. And at one point, my heart rate was just like skyrocketing. And he was like, okay, this is too much. Like she needs to go outside and actually cool down because I was really everything in me, my body, I, my, you know, my, my head knew what was going on, but my heart didn't, you know, and um, mm -hmm. I went right after that, there was a craft service truck and I went and hid in a ball behind the craft service truck and just like sobbed and just really kind of got it out and allowed myself to be me for a minute and, and to like feel it as me for a minute because I didn't want to just suppress it so much that it came back at a time that I don't want it to. You know, I, I think it's important to like just deal with things as they're happening. Um, but again, I, I had a job to do and, and you know, Aunt Catherine was there telling me, no, she wasn't. But I, I am my own Aunt Catherine in a way of saying the show kind of has got to go on right now. You know, people depend on you. I think that's more what it is rather than this entertainment quality of like, I have to, I have to keep going and it's show business. It's like, no, there's so many people there that are depending on me and their day is revolving around us getting this, this job done. And that comes from some of the, the training. Who, who were some of your Ashley's when you were growing up? What posters were on your walls? I had the most weird mod podge of, of so on my wall was Britney Spears, NSYNC, Avi, Metallica, um, and then I had Hillary, and then I had, who else did I had? I had Joan, and I had Pat Benatar. So I had no idea what, but somehow you should have seen my face when Britney covered I Love Rock and Roll in Crossroads. I lost, I melted down. That's like, that's seeing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit all in like one room. Like I actually lost my mind. Um, so this, that was worlds colliding beyond what I could have ever dreamed of. But yeah, I think I had mostly Britney and Joan Jett posters, which it kind of makes sense. It kind of, like, I'm just looking at you right now. I'm like, that completely makes, completely sense. makes sense. There's nothing off about that. Mm -hmm. Um, Justin Bieber, you and Justin chatting on Instagram, Ashley featuring Justin Bieber. Is that going to happen? Man, I think... I think we could we could come up with something very 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 special. So um, you know I got to reach out to him about that. As of now, nothing is in the works. But you know I remember I remember when he first came out with his like Bieber three. I think it was like a three D movie, right? So I was like yeah. sixteen, something like that, and he was a little bit younger than me. And I was sitting right in front of him, and he like leaned up to me and said, "Like, do you have like?" He asked me for advice in like a very kind of mellow, friendly way. And I said, just try to remember everything. Like try to kind of press record in your brain and remember everything because there were so many moments of my life when my mom will be like, do you remember when you got to perform for the queen? And I'm like, no, like I was, there was so much going on. I think so much to take in as such a young person um, mm. that I, I didn't remember to like take everything in. And that's something my dad always taught me was when you're on stage, whether it's when you get there or when you're about to leave, like, take a picture in your mind, you know, and like, 
remember it and savor it and take it in because things are moving so fast that it's so hard to just remember. And I remember like the carpet was just filled with screaming girls and everyone was everywhere and Usher was there and everything was going on. I'm like, just try to take a picture, just try to remember, you know? So we, we got yeah. a long relationship. So that would make a lot of sense. And I think he would be able to tell you, you know, some of his similarities and some of his differences with the Black Mirror episode also. Yeah, we need like a Justin version of Ashley. And then one quick question for you. What was the first audition you ever went on, whether you got the part or not? The first audition I ever went on, I did get the part. And it was for a baked beans commercial. You have to look it up, but I hated beans. And so they regretted hiring me so bad. It was Tammy Womack and I had to take this big bite. It was regional, it was regional. I had to take this big bite of beans. And I'm like, mm -mm. and then there was a spit bucket. My mom was freaking out. I would spit after every single take because I didn't like beans. Right there, that, that, <laughs> that smiling, that, that just says it all. Beans and a spit bucket. Yeah, just, <laughs> Mm -mm. Uh, my mom was like, you couldn't fake it for just like five hours. And my mom loved Tammy Womack, so she was so mad. And when are you going to get your next tattoo? When do you get tattoos now? I heard that's like fourth tier. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, you know, we're just waiting for them all to come out. I just think priority right now. Miley, this is amazing. It's always good seeing you, whether it's Zoom or in person. Yeah, um, I hope to see you in person just, soon. You just brought back so many memories. I'm just remembering like the first time, I, I, one of the first times I interviewed you was at E, and you were in your last season of Hannah Montana, do you remember? And I well, said- Well, ready. You said to me, I think this is gonna be the last season, and that caused, whoo, Disney was freaking out. Honey, <laughs> lot we count things. all the times Disney was freaking out. If I had a dog for every time, <laughs> I'd have as many dogs as I do now. Miley, you're amazing. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mark. Stay Thank safe, you. stay safe, and yeah. we'll talk soon. I'll talk. Take Thank care. You.